Hello, welcome to the Dr. Van Ingen uh, Clinical Psychology and Parenting Show. I want to welcome all of you across the world to this show uh, located in Sarasota, Florida. I want to discuss some key things today. We're doing the format a little different uh, than we did last week. Last week we talked about key things as I highlighted uh, some key um, some key things coming out of the new upcoming book, You Are Your Child's Best Psychologist, Seven Keys to Excellence in Parenting. So we talked about uh, some things. I read some, uh, some parts of my book. Uh, today I wanted to, again, highlight new book coming out, You Are Your Child's Best Psychologist. Um, also, I, and I wanted to talk about some reflection tips um, in there, I also wanted to highlight some key life lessons that can be easily implemented into parenting. And also, I want to discuss the three keys to um, the three keys that we want to look at in terms of parenting success. And they can come out of the marriage literature. In the marriage literature, what are the key things to a successful marriage? And this applies very much to our parenting. So let's get this party started. Again, welcome to all those watching. Um, to And we've got some people coming online now uh, to the Dr. Van Ingen Clinical Psychology and Parenting Show. All right, thank you for the pause there. Let's get right into some reflection tips. Um, I wanna talk about some reflection tips that uh, I think families are gonna find helpful. So let's go into reflection tips, then I wanna talk about life lessons, then I wanna talk about the three keys to parenting, uh, to parenting success that comes out of the marriage literature on what makes marriages thrive and flourish in today's society. Um, so first some reflection tips all right so um, the idea here is we want to encourage our children um, to uh, for, let me just give you some reflection tips this is in the category of little things that can make a big difference for our children okay um, reinforce smiling at every picture okay smile often with your children laugh at least once a day Take time to dump water on your own head and embarrass yourself in various ways for other kids' enjoyment. Help them elicit positive emotion in numerous capacities. All right, number two, find a way to establish an old-fashioned pen pal relationship uh, with a long-distance cousin or friend of each of, your, each of your children. Remind your child and emphasize this is something that the family merits. Here's a third reflection tip. If video games are already prominent in your household, and we know we've heard from Dr. Andrew Doan, video games, uh, if, if you haven't picked up the book Hooked on Games, that's a resource you want to pick up for your family. Uh, but consider setting limits. I run into families from time to time, especially with teenage boys, and the limits are not set. I just saw one of my, uh, a kid that I coach, I asked his mom, um, we we're just talking about how he can get his foot on the ball more, increase his technical training 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, just to improve his technical skills in, in soccer. Um, and, I, and I was looking for some self rewards. I said, hey, do you have limits on sock, on video games? I said, how, how much do you get to play video games a week? A half hour, hour a week, half hour a day, what is it? Uh, mom said, maybe I should. He said, no limits. I can play as much as I want. So we talked about how uh, the importance, um, and this is a boy who just turned nine. We talked about the importance of him putting limits on himself, but it's key that families put limits on their kids. So if hours are being used, consider 30 minutes a day as a daily limit. Consider a more conservative limit of weekends only. And if video games are not yet prominent in your household, 
consider facilitating a family culture that emphasizes a wide range of uh, entertainment options. So uh, if the take home message here today is setting limits, um, but remaining an engaged parent in school, sports, music, science, and other extracurricular activities, we want to uh, really expend effort on his or her achievements uh, because we want to focus on a balanced student athlete. Our children as balanced student athletes. Um, so I wanted to give you some tidbits here from reflection tips in a key section of how we can uh, encourage a child to be a balanced student, a balanced faithful student, a balanced student athlete. Uh, where God is first, family and friends are second, I am third, as Gail's, Gail Sayers said in the 60s, uh, which came out in his great friendship with Brian Piccolo. But when we think about raising our kids, we want to think about being a balanced individual. So those are some reflection tips that you're going to be able to find in the upcoming book, You Are Your Child's Best Psychologist. Um, and... Uh, I want to go into some life lessons. Uh, Regina Brett, she wrote a book, 50 Life Lessons. And many of these life, life lessons can be applied to our parenting. So listen to some of these things that I think that you're going to appreciate. Um, you know, our kids are going to face, and our teenagers face lots of challenges. And so we're going to need to dive into wisdom. Um, so we're not viewed as easily categorized. Or uh, if you think of the Charlie Brown, blah, 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 right? We go in one ear out the other, too much voice, you know, stop talking. So, so we want to continue to be a multi-level, have metacognition as a parent, being able to speak from lots of different angles. Right? Saying the same thing 10 different ways. That's metacognition. That's the key. And so when we get into being able to speak from a place of wisdom when dealing with these challenges, uh, check out some of these life lessons uh, that I think can apply. I think you'll appreciate as I share them with you today. Life isn't fair, but it's still good. Life is too short to waste time hating anyone. Make peace with your past so it won't screw up the present. Don't compare your life to others. You have no idea what their journey is all about. If a relationship has to be a secret, you shouldn't be in it. No one is in charge of your happiness but you. Who's in charge of your happiness? And this is a key point when you're talking about a second grade boy whose friends won't include him versus a 10th grade girl who doesn't feel accepted versus middle school, you know, it that can apply. Forgive everyone, everything. However good or bad a situation is, it will change. One of the best definitions of optimism is seeing problems as temporary. Temporary. Don't take yourself so seriously, no one else does. <laughs> Life isn't tied with a bow, but it's still a gift. A number of great life lessons there. I think the parents who are watching will appreciate. I want to get into now what are the key three things, the three areas of successful marriages. And we're going to find, you're going to find this, this applies to parenting. All right, so number one, the positive, and this is, Thoroughly researched, all right, John Burry, John Gottman, um, uh, Scott Stanley, a number of key marriage experts in the field, both uh, qualitatively, both who work with marriages and families, and then quantitatively, um, both in, in the research. And, the, and there's a ton of research that's done on what makes families healthy in psychology, in family systems research. And I want to apply that. One of the my... Um, goals here as Dr. Van Ingen in our Dr. Van Ingen Clinical Psychology and Parenting show is I want to take the best of what psychology has to offer and make a difference for those families and parents watching our show here at uh, uh, here 
in this show. And so, and I want it to be, I want it to matter. So our life can matter. And the biggest influence that we're going to make in this life is with our children and family. So I want to share that. I'm excited to share that. And I'm excited to share what are the key, three key things that makes a marriage flourish and thrive. Um, and so number one, the positive to negative moment ratio. And this is in conflict. In conflict, a positive to negative moment ratio. Um, and Gottman's done his research in terms of uh, during conflict, right? Marriages, what are the five key things uh, that marriages struggle with? Right? The five key points of conflict. Uh, sex, finances, in-laws, right? Doing chores and, uh, and parenting. Our kids. <laughs> So conflict is going to come up. So when there's conflict about our kids, extracurricular activities, how we're whether we're too lenient or uh, too tough on the kid, when when there's conflict, the positive to negative exchange ratio, and successful relationships have five positive exchanges to every one negative exchange, or in other words, positive moments to negative moments. So an eye roll, right? Um, to head shake, right? Um, to, um, I really appreciate your comment, right? That's a positive, right? That the head shake, the eye roll, that's a negative, right? 90% of communication is nonverbal. So a lot of the nonverbals that show small, tiny, little uh, moments of disconnection or rejection of that idea, um, those are negative moments. So Research has shown that neg positive to negative, it's that ratio. And we want to have five moments of positive to one moment of negative. All right, that is key. All right, so how does that apply to parenting? And, and the other thing, a couple of follow-ups with conflict. Repair attempts. So following moments of conflict, say you do say something, Right? What are the golden rules? No, never threaten the relationship. No name calling. Right? No, um, you always, you never over generalizations. Right? Um, so, bare minimum standards. We want to eliminate these out of conflict. We want to teach as parents. How, so, how does all this apply to parenting? We want to teach our kids excellent conflict management skills. Right? We want to teach our children. To have five, what are all the positive? And really work on that ratio from positive to negative. Uh, we want to teach our children excellent conflict management skills. We want to teach them that it really does make a difference. The, getting these standards, clarifying the standards, learning how to value an other person's uh, point of view. So uh, here's a skill that you can begin to work on with your kids right now. It's the skill of perspective taking. So I'm starting right now with my four-year-old. I'll say, all right, little buddy, tell me three reasons why. My little guy, he doesn't want to take a nap. All right, so I, so, um, and of course, you want to work on this with your teenagers on, on key moments of conflict. Do they think that watching this show is good? Or do they think that... Uh, uh, going out versus take home whatever it is whatever the point of conflict is um, but to get to my example uh i'll say all right little guy tell me three reasons why it would be good for you to take a nap okay and so i'm working on developing that skill all right little guy tell me now three reasons why you shouldn't take a nap or it would be a bad idea for you to take a nap and um you know for good reasons why to take a nap I feel tired, um, right? It, it's good for a four-year-old to take a nap, right? And three reasons why you shouldn't take a nap, right? Uh, you get the idea. The point is perspective taking. That's the skill we want to develop in our kids, perspective taking. It's a great skill, and we want our adolescents to learn how to master it, perspective taking. That's the key to future relationships. Perspective taking, that's the key, you guys. 
learning how to develop perspective taking in our children. That is going to make a huge difference. It's going to make a huge difference that they can learn how to take another person's perspective. So what are some of the key things that you struggle with as parents? Right? I, I've gotten lots of questions. How do you, this week, how do you deal with sibling rivalry? How do you deal with conflict in the back seat? How do you deal with um, children constantly fighting, hitting and kicking, and then constantly blame, right? Defensive, not being humble, not taking personal responsibility, right? So, so how do you deal with all of that? One of the key skills in all of that is perspective taking. And it starts, it's very tough to begin this. They, they say perspective taking doesn't settle until age seven, age eight. That's old research. You can begin to develop this skill uh, earlier than that, even at page, uh, or starting at age four, uh, age three. But it's slow to develop and depends on maturity and depends on the situation, depends on their mood, right? If they flood, Emotionally, the amygdala, which can develop a feedback loop with the hippocampus, uh, right? It, it blocks off. It can be a stuffer. Um, it blocks off the prefrontal cortex, the ability to learn abstract, inhibit, reason, think through, critically problem solve, right? And so they get upset. They slam the door. They can't take perspective, right? Because of the flooding, the emotional center takes over uh, the prefrontal cortex. A flooding happens. They can't think through things. 20 minutes later, it takes all of us physiologically to calm down 20 minutes when we get angry. Um, but they calm down. They begin to take perspective when walkthrough is shown. Here's a way you can think about it on what Shelley's point of view. So when it comes to sibling rivalry, when it comes to arguments in the backseat, when it comes to the, their aggression, their anger, the skill that you really want to develop is perspective taking. And I think that's one of the keys because when you start to appreciate the other's perspective, you can begin to nod, you can begin to show respectful, you can begin to convey kind behaviors, you can begin to work on the positive moments to get that five to one positive to negative exchange ratio. Here's the second thing. So Gottman has shown that he can predict successful marriages with 95% effectiveness rate by uh, with videotapes of couples in conflict and those couples who have a 5 to 1 positive to negative exchange ratio he can predict will make it and have a long lasting satisfying marriage okay so that's number one and I explained how that applies to parenting now I'm going to talk about number two Number two, so number one, the positive to negative moment ratio in conflict. And we want to help our kids learn how to have positive, convey positive in the middle of conflict. You say that's impossible when it comes to sibling rivalry and conflict and, and argumentation and aggression. The, the broad skill we want to develop is, is perspective taking. Okay, that's number one. Number two. What do marriages who thrive and flourish, what do they have? Okay. Number two is they have a good understanding of how they approach disagreement. So not only do they have positive moments, they express appreciations. They express gratitude. Thank you for sharing that opinion. Right? They have five positive moments to every one negative moment. Right? A hand, touch on the hand, a, an appreciation, uh, an expression of gratitude, five to one positive, five positives to every one negative. What's the second thing? The second thing, they recognize the demand withdraw pattern. The demand withdraw pattern. Okay, what is the demand withdraw pattern? This is the pattern that most marriages get into when conflict does happen, when things are said or something that happens that they don't like, all right, and, and conflict ensues. So what is it? It's women, 90, virtually 90% of the time, 
approach conflict harshly, too strongly, fiercely, and ninety virtually 90% of men withdraw from conflict. And so what women have to do in conflict is they have to approach conflict gently. Instead of the harsh startup, they have to have the gentle startup. And 90% of men, and I've seen it here in my uh, counseling office, 90% of men withdraw. So it's the fierce woman, the fearful man. It's the strong approach to conflict whether it be money, finances, sex, doing chores, doing the laundry, and 90% of men withdraw. They avoid. We avoid conflict. So what a woman has to do is learn to approach problems gently, and what men have to learn to do is to engage in those problems, to not withdraw, to face them. And yes, each person is different. Each person is different. But the key, and whether we're talking about women, women or men, the key in terms of how this applies to parenting is instead of the harsh startup with the strong voice, with the high volume, instead a gentle Startup. What's the take-home message here? Number two, the take-home message is approaching problems with our kids with a gentle startup. Gentleness and warmth. You've heard me talk about what the psychology literature points to as key, and that is warmth. Warmth is key, especially for fathers, warmth with our kids. Now, say a kid is sweeping the tile floor and they want to build up more dirt in order to make it look like they uh, did a bigger job, right? So they go get dirt from the back, backyard. They put dirt all over right in front of their, their dustpan. And then as you come out of the bedroom, they're cleaning up all this dirt. And you're like, where did this dirt come from? I brought it in from the backyard. <laughs> so here you are, you're listening to this and you're trying not to yell. You're pulling out, right? <laughs> we want to approach things with a gentle startup. Gentle startup. All right. I want to get to the third thing. And I'm just going to uh, go over, look here quickly at my computer. Um, and here is a third area. Um, as a reminder here, uh, the third area of a marriage who thrives and flourishes. They are aware, right, so number one, the five to one positive to negative moment ratio. Number two, they recognize the demand withdraw and how it applies to parenting is gentle startups, gentle. When we're talking about discipline, instruction, reprimanding, a gentle startup. Continue to instruct and teach, but applying the gentle startup. All right? And keeping our anger in check. It's hard to do. So I'm just encouraging parents out there to do a little bit more. Third, a marriage that thrives and flourishes is aware and working on family of origin issues. And family of origin issues are those things, you know, that you took from the past into your family, right? So maybe it's anger, right? Anger is a big one. If you brought anger into the current family, we want to work on that. We want to work. And if you go against your reinforcement history, you're in for a fight. But we have been reinforced to respond angrily. And maybe you're, in a, you're a ducks in a row type of person. So the ducks have to be in a row. And if they're not in a row, you get angry. Maybe you're a my way person. Things have to be done my way. Right? And 
if it's not done your way, you get angry. All right. Say, um, so what are the antidotes there? If you're a ducks in a row person, it's learning to be flexible with things disorganized, with spontaneity. If it's my way, what's the antidote? The antidote is, um, is being open to others' points of view, being open to uh, someone else making a decision of, of, to a mild degree, right? So, so if you come from that background, you want to work against that so your reaction is not in anger. Uh, say you have a bruise of inadequacy. Every time uh, someone says something, you feel that you are inadequate. Maybe that comes from your family background, right? Um, or you were told you'll never amount to anything, all right? And here you are, uh, you've amounted to a lot, but you're still dealing with a past hurt, right? Um, that's an unresolved issue. You want to work through that. How do you work through it? You continue to remind yourself of who you are, uh, loved, capable, uh, talented, strong, right, that you are able. You want to come against some of those messages that you were given in your family of origin. That's working through your family of origin issues. Um, say you're highly critical, right? It's common for individuals who are highly critical to be critical of their kids. You want, that's going to be crushing to their spirit. You want to be encouraging, not critical, right? These are the key issues. We all have a garden, and we have flowers in the garden. There are also weeds in the garden. We want to go into those weeds and not just trim them at the top, but go into the roots and really pull those weeds out of our garden. Some of those weeds we put there, many of those weeds were placed there by others, and they may have been internalized in our self-talk based on our family of origin. So what we want to do is we want to go get those weeds, pull them out, whether they were put there by you or put there by your family. Maybe negative self-statements. Maybe you heard, how can you be so stupid? Right? We want to get at some of those, uh, that weed. Maybe it's self-loathing and you're constantly looking for encouragement from your kids. Maybe it's a mom that's constantly looking in the mirror just saying, I'm so fat. And you've trained your teenage daughter to uh, say, no, ma, you look great. You don't look fat at all. Maybe it's just a cycle. We want to break that cycle. We want to become aware of those weeds, those family of origin issues. And it takes some reflection. It takes, uh, it takes some encouragement from those that you love. And it takes some openness to God uh, as you begin to look through and identify those weeds that need to get pulled out. So we're going to talk more about those family of origin issues, and that's a big one, and that's at the heart of trying to uh, identify some of the key issues in the upcoming book, You Are Your Child's Best Psychologist. So again, in review, we talked about uh, some key tips in terms of a balanced uh, student student athlete about your balance child living with balance and i gave you some reflection tips too we talked about life lessons you know one of my favorite life isn't fair but it is good uh, and god is good uh, and then three we talked about what are the three major areas that makes a marriage flourish and thrive and it's the positive to negative exchange ratio it is um, the recognizing our pattern to conflict, demand withdrawal, and, and then family of origin issues. And so we want to work against our family of origin issues so we can do things differently for our children. So some key things, um, the gentle startup and building the per skill of perspective taking. Uh, so apply those things in terms of what you can apply. I want to thank all of you for joining this show. As I close, what you can apply 
building, set out a goal to build perspective taking skills in your kids. And two, apply the gentle startup as you address issues in your household. Again, thanks uh, for, for showing up. Check us out. Go to parentingdoctors.com and subscribe uh, for the latest information at uh, parentingdoctors.com. Subscribe to our newsletter um, and you'll get the latest video, the latest information. Thank you for joining us here at the Dr. Van Ingen Clinical Psychology and Parenting Show. And uh, we'll see you next week on Tuesday at 1 p.m.